I always wondered, why did Jesus choose the Sunday after Easter to be the Feast of the Divine Mercy? And there was the initial clue that put me on to the search, and that was one day after sending out the people from the bakery to distribute the bread that the sisters baked to the various houses and stores, she went into the chapel, knelt down and said, Dear Lord, today I offer you all my prayers and my sufferings and my works so that the feast that you want may be established. But she said, Jesus, tell me one thing. They tell me such a feast already exists, so why should I talk about it? And Jesus just flatly answered, and who knows anything about it? Even those who should know about it and teach about it don't know about it. Therefore, I want that image that I told you to paint to be blessed and spread around the world so that everyone may know of my mercy. Now, what my discovery was that the eighth day of a feast was very important already in the Old Covenant and that passed on to the New. But then later on in the New Covenant, it sort of lost its place. In the oldest existing document in the Catholic Church where anything is said about liturgy or religious services, it's called the Constitutions of the Twelve Apostles. It gives instructions about the liturgical celebrations that should be carried on in the church. And after explaining that following the preparations of Lent, the great feast of the Lord's resurrection should be celebrated with the Eucharist, the second sort of entry said, after this feast, let there be celebrated another great feast the eighth day itself. And evidently, what followed was a contribution of the Apostle Thomas. It was believed that each of the 12 apostles put something into this document um, concerning uh, worship. And the second contribution was that of Thomas. Says, when I, Thomas, received the assurance when I was in great doubt. And that was on the Sunday after Easter, because he was not present in the cynical when Jesus appeared the evening of uh, Easter itself. I thought for so many years that that Sunday after Easter was well. We called it the octave of Easter. But people forgot what an octave was. And after Vatican II, only two octaves were left in the church, Christmas and Easter. All the others for the Feast of the Sacred Heart, Corpus Christi, etc., were all dissolved. And what did that mean? It means that something was forgotten about the eighth day of a feast. For example, when we celebrate Easter, it is a feast that lasts eight days from Sunday to Sunday, but it is considered liturgically one day. And following the Hebrew custom of the Passover, the people were to meet on the first day, and then again on the last day. It was an obligation for the people of God to come together to worship and praise God on those two days of the feast. But then we have a clue from the Gospel of St. John that it was the eighth and last day of the feast that was the greatest day of the feast. Not so much the first. And we know that when Jesus went up to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the dedication of the temple, which lasted eight days, and St. John says, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus got up in the temple and cried out, Whoever is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. For as the scriptures say, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And St. John says, he cried this out in the temple. 
So what about this eighth day? The eighth day came about by Jewish tradition that after the celebration of the Feast of the Passover, I don't know which one, I, I didn't get to the bottom of that yet, God said to his people, after the seven days were over, stay with me one more day. But in the calendar, there's only seven days in the week, and they keep on repeating. And he says, stay with me one more day. And the people understood that it is the day on which the Lord will gather his people together with the law into it, unto himself to be with him forever and eternity. In other words, in the day that's never going to see sunset, that will never end, that's eternity. And so for the Jewish people, the number eight began to mean eternity. And something to be looked forward to, the meeting of God with his people. And so uh, David wrote a psalm, the sixth psalm, and he entitled it, For the Octave. And that psalm is sort of a penitential psalm. It is calling people to repentance so that they may be ready for that day when God comes to collect his people to himself forever. And so there is that attitude, that, that atmosphere of expectation of being ready, of keeping vigil in order that when God comes, his people are ready to be united to him. And isn't this what Jesus wants to be happening on the Sunday after Easter by offering that tremendous promise of complete remission of all sins and punishment? Not only the punishment for forgiven sins that a preliminary indulgence gives, but that with a worthy Holy Communion on that day, all our sins and all the punishment of them are nil. And if we would die just like John Paul II did right after Holy Communion, we are with the Lord forever. And so, St. Paul tells us in the Epistle to the Ephesians that Jesus is going to come to claim his bride. And she has to be, that means the church, the, the gathering of all the believers. And this bride has to be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Absolutely pure. Waiting for him, not being devoted to anything or anyone else. And that means free of anything that will hold us back from union with God. And so Jesus gives us that great privilege of complete forgiveness of all sin and punishment that we would be ready to greet him when he comes to, to take us up to himself forever. And then the fathers of the church, still knowing that tradition of old, mentioned that that eighth day is to be a reminder that the Lord is coming back and that we should be standing, you read it in the epistle to the Hebrews, as though on tiptoe in expectation for the Lord's return. And that's the whole meaning of the message of divine mercy and of those special privileges, those special graces that the Lord attached to the devotion of the divine mercy, particularly on Mercy Sunday and three o'clock every afternoon and the chaplet. If we read those things in the diary, we will see all the tremendous promises Jesus made. And if the devil is complaining, this is not just, that God is being too easy with us, we could be reminded of what St. Paul said about justice. When we hear that word, we're thinking of punishment for a crime. But St. Paul says, God's justice is primarily in this, that he keeps his promises. <laughs> 